Okay, welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, good morning. This is Amrita Mehta, and welcome back to the fourth session of this webinar series on applications of remote sensing to soil motion evapotranspiration. Um, today, we are fortunate to have guest speakers. Uh, Professor Rick Allen from University of Idaho and Professor Aisha Akili from University of Nebraska Lincoln, um, and uh, they are going to talk about their evapotranspiration product to us. This is just to uh, remind you that uh, homework was posted on our website uh, last week, and there will be one more homework uh, coming up next week as well. Um, and as just as a reminder. Those of you who attend all five sessions and complete the homework assignments will be uh, awarded certificate of com completion uh, about a month or two af after the webinar series is over. And just a reminder that this is our website where all the presentation material uh, as well as recordings uh, can be found for this webinar series and a lot more other information on the website as well. So without further delay, I want to invite uh, Sheikh Kili and um, Rick Allen to talk about matrix evapotranspiration and, and its applications. We did talk a little bit about and we introduced what matrix is in session one, but here is a detailed overview and information about the data and um, uh, access of this data as well. So thank you. Here, welcome. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, hi, my name is Rick Allen and uh, Aisha Klitsch uh, will be co-presenting both on the metric and uh, eFlux applications. We're very uh, delighted to have this opportunity to speak to, to this particular community uh, about uh, applications involving primarily Landsat satellite and then using surface energy balance. Uh, we'd like to recognize some of our co-developers listed at the bottom of this screen, uh, Ricardo Treza of the University of Idaho, Tony Morse, uh, Bill Kramer of Idaho uh, helped get us started in the early days about 15 years ago and a, a current uh, development partner is uh, Justin Huntington at uh, the Desert Research Institute. Uh, Amita, on the first seminar, uh, gave good background on evapotranspiration, uh, what it's used for, why we need it. But just to give a brief summary, <clears throat> oftentimes uh, field level evapotranspiration is an essential input to state departments of water resources for uh, water rights management, uh, water allocation, uh, sometimes water rights enforcement. Uh, during water shortages. So it's a very critical component with water resource management. At the federal level, uh, U.S. Bureau of Reclamation uh, has responsibility for uh, both uh, water demand and water supply management of many of the federal projects. Uh, they have a, a very important need for evapotranspiration information. And then, of course, the U.S. Geological Survey conducts uh, a wide range of hydrologic Base studies, uh, including groundwater modeling, uh, they have a, a large need for spatial distribution of water consumption information. And more and more, of course, we need uh, good information on water consumption for managing the environment, ecological studies, endangered species. And down at the irrigation level, uh, farms manage water at the field scale, and uh, they benefit from information, and then more and more, we are seeing uh, water uh, issues come into our court systems uh, where we have various parties vying for limited uh, resources. Some of the applications that we'll talk about today, um, and I, I, I think one of the emphasis areas of today's presentation is to not talk only about the production of the ET maps, but also talk about what they are and can be used for. Here's a short list of some of the primary applications in the West and Midwest parts of the United States. 
Um, of course, we can't plan without good information on water consumption. Uh, groundwater systems, uh, more and more, we are mandated to uh, have sustainable depletion from aquifer systems. Uh, we can get much better estimates of what those levels of use are by knowing the actual consumption of water from the aquifer systems. We mentioned endangered species issues, both fish and other uh, species. And uh, court cases we talked about, uh, when we transfer water from agriculture to cities, in some cases, there may be water rights uh, transfers or leasings or buybacks. And so we need to have a good estimate of what the historical water consumption has been. And we can also use uh, ET maps for monitoring uh, near real time water consumption. Uh, just to give a, an idea of what we are talking about when we uh, look at uh, evapotranspiration maps, uh, I'm sure all, all of you are familiar with that. Here's an example of a seasonal by a growing season evapotranspiration from southeast Idaho over the eastern snake aquifer. It's for the period from April through October. Uh, this was developed uh, using the metric process that we will talk about in the Landsat imagery. Uh, we can see the high ET areas on the plain from irrigation. Uh, we can also see uh, some high ET in the, in, up at higher, higher elevations in the mountain areas where we have forested systems. So uh, the advantage of Landsat is that we can get uh, relatively high resolution information uh, over a wide range of uh, land cover types. And of course, it's oftentimes total millimeters of water consumed over an extended time period. In this case, the growing season in southern Idaho, April through October. So the legend here shows us millimeters uh, for that period. That's often uh, meaningful information for estimating depletions to the resource and then also uh, uh, for managing and, and water accounting. We can zoom in uh, a bit on that same image and uh, we can see field to field variation in water use. Uh, we can see that it varies substantially from field to field. Each field has its own behavior. So this is why we uh, focus on Landsat uh, imagery. Landsat has 30 meter resolution in the shortwave bands uh, and then anywhere from 60 to 120 meters resolution in the thermal bands. Uh, oftentimes over on the left we see some riparian systems along streams. Uh, ecologically this is important. It's also important for estimating total depletion to the water resource. If we zoom in even closer uh, we can see within field variation, uh, which is meaningful also at the farm scale for improving uniformity of irrigation, for example, uh, seeing areas of uh, high ET versus low ET. So uh, a satellite like Landsat with 30 meter resolution is very essential and important for field scale water management. We use energy balance uh, in metric, and there are a number of other uh, energy balance models used for evapotranspiration besides metric. Uh, today, we'll concentrate on metric. Uh, reasons that we use energy balance is the fact that evapotranspiration consumes energy. Anytime we go from the liquid to the vapor state, uh, there's a large amount of energy required, and so if we can make a good estimate of what that energy consumption is, we can transform that into an equivalent depth of water evaporated. Uh, the energy balance, uh, this equation we see in the right on, on this uh, simple schematic, we rearrange it so that evapotranspiration is on the left-hand side and uh, then we have the four primary components of the energy balance on the right-hand side. Recognizing that the primary energy source is uh, uh, radiation from the sun and from the sky, 
Uh, the net just means what is lingering at the surface, and then that is going to be partitioned and, and consumed either in <clears throat> sensible heat flux to the air, heating of the air through convection, or there's a portion of it that may be conducted into the ground, call that ground heat flux. And then uh, the remaining part of the energy from net radiation that we do not see in G and H, we presume goes into evapotranspiration. Now there are a few minor consumers of uh, energy, for example, photosynthesis um, incorporation into the plant, but those are usually less than 1%. Um, and so we, uh, we can generally neglect those in the energy balance. And again, the basic truth is that evaporation consumes energy. Because the satellites do not see water vapor flux at the surface, we have to more or less come in through the back door and use the thermal information that we can see to provide uh, relatively good estimates <clears throat> of these three energy balance components on the right hand side. One reason that we like to use energy balance also is it gives us the actual ET as opposed to potential ET. For example, uh, in, uh, areas that may suffer from some water shortage, either irrigated areas or some uh, natural rain fed areas during droughts. Uh, we can have shortages of ET. Uh, the energy balance allows us to estimate the actual ET directly under those situations. Uh, here's a list of some other factors that can impact uh, and reduce evapotranspiration, including disease. Uh, we, we can investigate some of the uh, variables that affect crop phenology and growth, including variety, planting dates, the density, uh, some areas of the world suffer from uh, uh, salinity of the water uh, with potentially some reductions in evapotranspiration. These two graphs uh, we want to use just to show um, that there's a very strong relationship over on the left hand side between evapotranspiration and uh, surface temperature. Uh, the right-hand graph shows the same thing, evapotranspiration versus a vegetation index called the NDVI. NDVI stands for Normalized Difference uh, Vegetation Index. The ET shown here is expressed as a, a relative fraction of reference ET. We will define what reference ET is in a moment. Uh, here's the ratio of the fraction of reference ET. Uh, but the reference ET more or less represents the near maximum amount of ET that's limited by energy availability. We, we just talked about the energy balance. So that gives us a reference maximum value. And then if we divide that into the actual ET, we get a nice normalized fraction that generally scales between about 0 and 1. So it's very convenient. Uh, to evaluate evapotranspiration information in this way and some of the spatial variation. Uh, and, and then also inside of metric, for example, we use the ETRF during our calibration. What we want to show here is that the, there is a relationship between relative ET and the amount of vegetation present as we would uh, expect. But we do see a fair amount of variation from field to field. These are a number of desert and agricultural pixels down in the Rio Grande Valley of New Mexico during 2002. Uh, we, we see that for some low NDVI, there are fairly high values of evaporation, probably coming from some wet fields that have been recently irrigated or areas of shallow water table where there's free evaporation from the surface. We can also see for some moderate uh, level NDVI, some relatively low values of ET that uh, probably are fields that are suffering from water shortage and uh, consequently a reduction in evapotranspiration. Uh, on the other hand, if we look at the relationship between uh, relative evapotranspiration and surface temperature, we see a much stronger 
more singular relationship. Uh, we, we do want to point out that uh, these ET estimates come from the surface energy balance that is based on surface temperatures. So the estimates are not independent and they probably overstate the close proximity as opposed to what's actually happening in reality. But we do just want to show a, a fairly strong uh, relationship, although we do have uh, up to 10 and 15 percent variation in ET for the same amount of surface temperature. But what we want to point out here is that there's a very close range, a variation in surface temperature associated with the cooling effect of evaporation. And we use that to our advantage uh, in a process like metric. One of the areas where uh, use of energy balance is quite important is in a very low water input system. Here's an example from southern Idaho on a sagebrush desert system. The average uh, rainfall is uh, less than 150 millimeters per year, so it's a very low input system. We're, we are showing four days of measurements with eddy covariance here. Uh, and the first one here is one day after rain. The orange line, uh, let me pull the pointer up here. The orange line that we see are measurements from two uh, eddy covariance systems. Uh, and we see a fairly substantial amount of evapotranspiration because of wetness of the soil. Uh, these top lines uh, represent net radiation. So we are consuming most of the energy. But as we move to day two and the soil surface is drying, we see that the ET signal is getting smaller and smaller. And then finally, three and four days after uh, rainfall, the soil surface is dry. Uh, most of the net radiation now is going into sensible heat flux represented by uh, three of these lines. And so we uh, have a very small ET signal. So these are conditions where it's quite important to have as accurate an energy balance as we can. Just a review of those three components of the energy balance that we solve for from Landsat, uh, net radiation, susceptible heat flux, and soil heat flux, uh, where they come from. Uh, net radiation, we break down into both the short wave and long wave components. For long wave, it's both the emitted long wave from the surface, we get that from satellite, and then the incoming long wave, we estimate that from the emitted long wave and transmissivity. Uh, sensible heat flux, as we'll cover in the next slide, uh, we estimate a surface air temperature gradient, uh, uh, base that off from the surface uh, image that we have, and then we uh, have to include aerodynamics because sensible heat flux is a convective process. Soil heat flux, we generally estimate that directly from, as a, a in relationship to the value of sensible heat flux. Uh, and with some moderation due to the shading effect of vegetation using fairly standard types of approaches. A quick look at uh, sensible heat flux uh, estimation, and, and we're not going to go very far into the details of the algorithms used in metric, but just to give you a sense of the basic equation, we use a standard electrical analog uh, equation for sensible heat flux where we have uh, air density. See, I lost my little pointer, but uh, up, up at the top we have uh, the rho is air density. We have specific uh, heat uh, capacity. And then the, the DT, as shown in the schematic, is a uh, vertical air temperature gradient uh, from uh, two points in the air stream above the surface. So we don't touch the surface. Uh, we go from a Z1 to Z2. And then R sub AH is the aerodynamic resistance between those two elevations. Uh, over here in the lower left-hand corner, you can, uh, you can see we use a standard equation for that with some uh, stability corrections for buoyancy effects. 
One of the advantages of using this DT is that we can inversely calibrate that function as a, a function of uh, surface temperature. Uh, we don't need to rely on absolute values for radiation and, uh, uh, excuse me, radiance-based temperature and uh, aerodynamically-based temperature, some of the differences. We don't need to have absolute measurements of air temperature. We actually derive this DT function by inverse uh, uh, inversion of the energy balance equations uh, so that we uh, eliminate many of the biases and uncertainties. Uh, looking quickly at uh, soil heat flux, uh, soil heat flux is, can be quite large for a desert system like that sagebrush that we looked at. Here's a plot of soil heat flux versus net radiation. Um, net radiation can be as high as 600 watts per square meter, for example, and ground heat flux can be almost one-third that much. So it is a fairly important estimate. Uh, here are some measurements uh, taken from that sagebrush site, and so we develop uh, equations to estimate G both from net radiation and, and soil heat flux. Uh, We'll run through a, a few slides here that uh, just show some of the estimate estimations coming from the energy balance components. Uh, here's that same sagebrush site. Uh, the left-hand photo or graphic uh, just shows the various components of the energy balance. Uh, looks like I've lost my pointer, but let's see if I can find it somewhere. I, oh, here it is. Okay. So we have uh, net radiation here. This is uh, comparing to eddy covariance data for four different Landsat dates during one year. Uh, net radiation estimates from the model versus the measured ground data. Here's the very strong sensible heat flux where most of the energy is being dissipated as convection into the airstream. Uh, here's our uh, ground heat flux. And then we can see the very low ET signal that we talked about. So uh, you can see relative air is fairly large, although absolute air, we're uh, generally within 30, 40 watts per square meter. Uh, but we can appreciate it's very critical to get these components estimated as well as we can so that when we difference them, we get as accurate an estimate of this very low ET signal as possible. And so that's why we do a lot of uh, inverse calibration and bias correction, which we are showing in this graphic here. Uh, we, we recognize that we have biases in uh, net radiation estimation. There's some uncertainty in the surface temperature uh, image uh, from the Landsat satellite, a few degrees. Um, Generally, uh, we have biases probably in some of the components of uh, aerodynamic-based sensible heat flux, including roughness estimates. Therefore, we introduce a bias into our DT function that represents the near surface air temperature gradient. That transfers into a, a known and planned bias into the sensible heat flux estimate. But then that bias is removed when we solve the energy balance for ET. Another way of looking at this is these bottom two equations where the top equation we are during the calibration, we are solving the energy balance for H in this case with known values of ET or, or latent uh, heat of uh, evaporation, LE, uh, where we uh, specify these values for a very low ET condition in the image and a high ET condition in the image. Uh, so knowing these values, we can back calculate for H, and then from H, we can derive the DT that is responsible for that value for H, and then derive our relationship between DT and surface temperature. Knowing that any biases in these inputs factor into H, but then when we uh, apply this equation at 30 million pixels in the image, uh, the bias in H is largely removed from the same biases that may exist in Rn and G, so we end up with a non-biased estimate of Le, which is uh, very critical for uh, many of the water rights and, and uh, evapotranspiration uses that we have in uh, Western systems. 
Uh, metric itself, uh, we like to think of it as uh, an engineering tool as opposed to a science tool. Uh, it's designed for uh, fairly low level uh, Landsat scene based applications, uh, you know, say a 200 kilometer by 200 kilometer area, um, where really good mm -hmm. estimates of ET are quite important. So it's probably worth some time by the human for review and intervention. In fact, one uh, formula for accuracy, and this applies pretty much to any model, is you want to start with good physics, <clears throat> but invest good human effort and review time and intervention as uh, required to improve the accuracy. So we often will iterate through applications of uh, metric with evapotranspiration, make reviews, make some adjustments uh, to get uh, as, as good of an image as we think is possible. Some of the fine tuning that we do in metric, and I'll, I'll, we'll just mention these in this list, but uh, we try to account for during spring conditions, we may have soils that were frozen at night that impacts the thermal signal we get. Uh, any amount of organic mulch, say straw from wheat systems can impact the soil heat flux. Uh, soil heat flux, uh, we, we Optimize that just to learn more about it during energy balance inversion. Um, and uh, for estimating water, we instead of using energy balance, we do use a direct aerodynamic based estimation for evaporation from water because we do have the surface temperature of water. Uh, so it's a fairly straightforward uh, method to estimate directly uh, from the thermal imagery. Uh, a few more examples uh, of applications of uh, metric just checking against ground measure data. Here's some data provided by one of our research partners, uh, Dr. Samuel Ortega of the University of Talca, Chile. Uh, we're looking here at uh, some olive orchards uh, with eddy covariance measurements uh, here. And uh, similar to that previous graph we looked at, uh, we can break down um, estimates from the metric process on Landsat overpass days versus the ground measurements. Net radiation, again, is the stronger signal. Uh, olives tend to be fairly low water use systems because of the sparse vegetation and stomatal control by the olives. Uh, so our second largest component is the sensible heat flux. And then ground heat flux and the ET signal, again, which is quite low, for these olives uh, is on the order of uh, 100 watts per square meter. But relatively good correspondence to a, a one to one line. Now, <clears throat> metric and other processes for ET from Landsat and other satellites uh, give us a snapshot of ET at the time of the satellite overpass. And in the case of Landsat, we may have images every eight days with two Landsats or every 16 days with one Landsat. Um, but we have to ask the question, what do we do in between those satellite overpasses? So we tend to use that fraction of ET that we've introduced already, reference ET, to uh, extend these snapshots over time, recognizing that uh, relative ET is a relative conservative value because it's scaled to the reference ET. And then we use the reference ET based on weather data or gridded weather data um, to incorporate the impacts of day-to-day -day, uh, variation in uh, evapotranspiration as impacted by the weather system itself. We'll talk a little bit here about reference evapotranspiration. Uh, we use what's called the uh, American Society of Civil Engineering uh, standardized PIM and Monteith equation, uh, showing on the bottom there. It's a very standard, widely used equation. It utilizes uh, solar radiation, air temperature, wind speed. This U variable here is wind speed. And then uh, some measurement of humidity so that we can calculate what we call the vapor pressure deficit. So this equation <clears throat> is formulated with fixed coefficients to give us an estimate of what we call reference ET that represents a specific vegetation, in this case, either for alfalfa, as we'll see in the next slide, or for grass uh, also. 
Uh, we like to use alfalfa in metric because alfalfa is a very strong consumer of energy and it, it tends to approach the maximum ET possible. <clears throat> Here's a photo. Uh, if you're not familiar with alfalfa, this lower right hand uh, field is uh, uh, an alfalfa field. You, from this uh, small person, you can get an idea of it's about half a meter tall. Uh, clip grass is the other reference type used in the Pema Monteith equation. Uh, here is one way that we measure evapotranspiration. This is uh, called a weighing lysimeter. Here's during the installation at Kimberly, Idaho, back in the 60s by the USDA. Uh, this is an inner tank that's placed on uh, weighing scales. Uh, we measure the weight of this tank every half hour, even every five minutes. And as evaporation occurs from the surface of the lysimeter, the mass changes, and we just simply measure the change in weight over time and derive a, a very good estimate of ET. Here's some data from that lysimeter with alfalfa. The purple is uh, the lysimeter measurement, and the ETR is coming from that standardized ASCE equation. We can see very good correspondence even during the nighttime between the equation and the measurements. Here's another day, uh, a few days later, where we had a cloud system come over, and uh, both the lysimeter and the equation that's based on weather data had uh, very similar sensitivity. So uh, we, we feel quite confident that that Pema Monteith coupled with uh, high quality weather data can give us a very good estimate of what the maximum evapotranspiration is. We use that information both during the calibration of metric and then we also use it uh, during the time in integration between Landsat imagery. Here's just one more look uh, just to build your confidence if you're not uh, familiar with the ASE Penman. These are daily measurements by that same lysimeter uh, system in the dark blue and then the light blue color overlay is uh, evapotranspiration uh, estimated for the reference alfalfa crop by the ACE Pema Monteith uh, for full cover period so we, we don't look at when the alfalfa is cut because then it's no longer in a reference state. Uh, to go from the time of the satellite overpass, uh, here's again ET millimeters per hour on the left. Over on the right is uh, uh, fraction, the fraction of reference ET scale between about zero and one, or in this case about one point. Or actually, it, we're, we're using just the green dots for the right hand uh, axis. We can see that these the sugar beets over time. Uh, you, you can see the consistency of the ETRF over time pretty much, and then this white dot represents the 24-hour average. And we can see that the value that we get at the time of the satellite overpass, say at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, is very similar to the 24-hour value. So we use this to jump from the overpass time to the full day to make an estimate of ET for the extended time period. And then for the interpolation, as we talked about, uh, uh, each of these blue dots is a landside overpass day. Uh, for every pixel, we get an estimate of what the relative ET is. And then because ETRF is uh, relatively conservative over time, uh, we can use a spline function or a linear function to interpolate between these values. And then we estimate reference ET every day using the weather data, either from gridded weather data sets or from individual weather stations. So we can derive then an estimate of ET for every day that occurs in between these images. Then we integrate under that curve to get our monthly or seasonal or annual evapotranspiration. Here's a, a look at that same lysimeter in, this, in Kimberly, in this case planted to sweet corn. It's about two meters by two meters in diameter. Here's a, a look at uh, that growing season, April through September in this case. Uh, measurement by the lysimeter and then estimate by metric. And in this case, it came out very, very close. It's not always this close, um, but it just happened to for this particular year. Back in 1989, uh, that the sugar beet estimate was uh, uh, quite quite close. Uh, 
it's, it's very valuable to conduct what we call blind comparisons where the application with the satellite is done in the absence of any knowledge of uh, the ground measurements. In this case, here's some data compiled by one of our partners, uh, Justin Huntington of DRI, Desert Research Institute. Uh, these are uh, mostly eddy covariants, some bone racial systems operated by the U.S. Geological Survey over some irrigated agriculture in uh, western Nevada. And uh, without having the data and making metric applications, uh, Justin was able to uh, come up with these estimates of seasonal ET. So it includes the impact of time integration versus the seasonal ET uh, measured by the Bowen ratio and eddy covariance systems. And uh, Justin has put some error bars on here to give us some uncertainty estimate of both the ET measurement and then also the estimate coming out of metric. And uh, we can see relatively good correspondence, even for some fairly low uh, ET systems that probably are not irrigated but are using only uh, background uh, precipitation. Another blind comparison that was done by Utah State University and the U.S. Geological Survey, one component was in the Palo Verde Irrigation District, which is in southeast California near Blythe. If you're familiar with it, it's about 100,000 acres of irrigation, and uh, they uh, conducted ET estimates both using a district-wide water balance and then using some Bowen ratio uh, technology. Um, we processed a number as, uh, of Landsat scenes, as did other teams that participated. I'll just show the results here, identifying uh, metric um, on this row here. Um, and uh, this bias is, is the difference between the ground measurements and the metric estimates, and, and metric is within about 2%. Uh, some of the other methods were as, uh, with uh, less than 10% accuracy also, so we feel that 10% uncertainty is quite good from satellite-based estimation. So we had three different methods that were uh, able to uh, estimate season-long uh, ET within 10%. If we look at the ET from the water balance, uh, similar results. Uh, the metric uh, estimates were within about 2% again, and uh, two other methods were within 12%, which again, we feel is probably adequate for much of the water application uh, work, water management. And of course, the closer we are, the more comfort we have, and, and it's always good. Just another quick comparison with other uh, lysimeter measurements. Actually, I, I think I'll skip this, but this uh, graph was just showing on each image date, we can compare against something like the lysimeter just to understand the behavior and uh, see the change in ET with development, in this case, with a sugar beet crop in southern Idaho. Well, let's move on to some of the applications where accuracy is pretty important. Let's start with an application in <clears throat> southern Idaho. Uh, all of these yellow dots are irrigation wells. The red just shows some of the irrigation areas. Uh, the yellow irrigators are generally junior, we call them, to some of the senior irrigators uh, here without wells that rely on river water and canals. Uh, they have higher priority water rights. Um, there's a lot of tension between those two systems. We use uh, metric ET, here you can see for five years, uh, with an overlay of a groundwater grid to make better estimates of some of the impact to the aquifer by the uh, well users. Uh, there have been a number of uh, law, uh, court-based uh, uh, water calls, we call them, where the uh, senior water users uh, file a complaint against the junior water users and then the state has to do some type of intervention. Uh, just show you some of the news headlines here. <clears throat> so the state had to go in and identify some of the junior water users who may have to curtail some of their pumping based on their water right uh, age uh, so that uh, they would not impact some of the water flow in the Snake River here that, uh, again, impacts the water supply to the surface water users. So metric was used in this case. Here's a map of evapotranspiration to allow the state to come in and make an estimate of, of the spatial distribution 
of depletion to the aquifer by these pumpers so that uh, they can make a good judgment of how far away from the river to uh, curtail water and then at what date of water right permit to cut off uh, to satisfy the water supply for the senior water users. So fairly serious applications of evapotranspiration mapping. Another way that uh, the ET is used is water rights buyback, where uh, we may buy water from irrigated, <clears throat> excuse me, irrigated agriculture to leave more water in the river system. In this case, one uh, application was in the Snake River for endangered species. Uh, we've, uh, the state has bought some marginal irrigation water rights through negotiation. Of course, farmers always want to sell the full water right amount, but the state uh, Department of Water Resources only wants to buy the actual wet water, we call it, the amount of water that's been consumed historically. So the satellite is very useful for that. Here on the left is uh, evapotranspiration from this uh, region that was bought out. And then on the right is one year after the retirement of the land. And we can see that there's still some residual evaporation occurring, but uh, two years later, it, it has returned to a desert situation. Uh, here's an application by uh, our co-developer, uh, Aisha Klitsch of the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. Uh, again, uh, making applications for a local state uh, natural resources district that has to monitor, uh, manage and monitor both groundwater and surface water depletions. Um, and here's a map of monthly evapotranspiration showing the spatial distribution. Uh, other applications have included along the uh, middle Rio Grande of uh, New Mexico that we already talked about. Uh, it's a fairly narrow corridor of riparian vegetation and also irrigation. Um, and there's invasion of salt cedar. So there's a lot of questions related to water consumption. One of the things that we can do with spatial evapotranspiration maps is we can sample all of the pixels that are associated with a certain land use class. In this case, uh, salt cedar, the invasive species, and then uh, cottonwoods. We're showing here the annual evapotranspiration consumption versus the frequency distribution. So these are like histograms. And we can see that the distribution of ET for cottonwood varies widely from very high values to low values, depending on the proximity to a stream or to shallow groundwater. Same thing occurs for salt cedar. So having the spatial evapotranspiration maps really helps us to appreciate the spatial distribution uh, amongst those two systems uh, to be able to compare the relative water consumption. Uh, here's just a, a table showing some of the relative values that we don't need to go into. Um, another nice use of thermal-based uh, energy balance for ET is we can uh, look at places that uh, maybe have some shallow groundwater. And uh, here's a graph showing precipitation monthly in a part of the Rio Grande over some bare soil. And we see evaporation that exceeds substantially the precipitation and we can use this to identify areas where the shallow groundwater causes uh, free evaporation from the soil. This is one place that we could go into to uh, rectify that situation and conserve water that is not being used beneficially. Other application areas have included California. Uh, we just looked at the Palo Verde area here. Uh, another large irrigated area is the Imperial, Imperial Valley uh, of California. Uh, right next to Mexico. And uh, some of this water it has been transferred over the last 15 years uh, to the city of San Diego, Los Angeles. And so there's a need to monitor the impact of that transfer and to help manage the water. Uh, fallow, fallowing of fields uh, back to Palo Verde, um, we, we can monitor, help the cities monitor the impacts of fallowing on the evapotranspiration. Uh, Nevada, as we talked about, uh, water is moving also from irrigated agriculture and from phreatophytic systems into the cities, uh, so we need uh, evapotranspiration information for monitoring that. Uh, we've seen applications in the Klamath River Basin of uh, Oregon and Northern California where we have some real tension in water use between endangered species, uh, salmon recovery, and irrigated agriculture. 
there's over allocation of water and so we can use uh, monitoring of irrigation to help us with uh, determining the impact of retiring some of the agricultural areas. Here's a just a time lapse showing one part of California where, or excuse me, of Oregon, where there's been some retiring of irrigated areas. We can see portions of that irrigation area through the more brown colors, uh, seeing a reduction of ET during the course of the growing season as water is uh, pulled off and, and retired, for example, right here. Here's just a close up uh, of the time lapse again showing areas where uh, there's been a reduction in, in water application to leave more water in the stream systems. And we can use the satellite to monitor associated reduction in ET corresponding to the retirement of the irrigated uh, water application. So this is a time lapse just going through the growing season. <clears throat> uh, EVAP transpiration maps have been used in uh, Supreme Court cases. Uh, for example, a recent case between the state of Montana and Wyoming, uh, we have introduced metric based uh, EVAP transpiration maps. And so they, it's being vetted even at the US Supreme Court level. Uh, so it, it's becoming a, a very uh, accepted uh, process to uh, estimate spatial uh, variation in evapotranspiration. We'll talk about at the end of today's uh, presentation some of the challenges uh, of not having enough frequency of uh, Landsat scale imagery. We'd sure like to see more Landsat. Eventually we would like to see a Landsat type of overpass every four days, not just every eight or 16 days to mitigate for clouds. In fact, here's a showing four different images where we've masked out the clouds. You can see it really impacts our knowledge of spatial uh, evapotranspiration. Um, here's a case in Nebraska, some of the work with the University of Nebraska. Again, we have to mask out the clouds, then we have to fill it in using some type of information gathering from adjacent images in time to fill the missing cloud data but it's never a perfect process. But here is a application in Wyoming where we have been able to produce seasonal evapotranspiration uh, after cloud filling. So it is possible, but it's much, much easier when we have more satellites so that we have more clear sky images available. For example, uh, here's where we just uh, allow an automated filling in of uh, of uh, clouded areas that I just showed you for Nebraska, we can see what the information we filled in with does not fit the actual uh, outside areas that are real data. So we have to make some adjustments using some soil water balance models. We get a much better fit that way, but it's a fair amount of work to do and uh, we would really be helped by having more satellites. But it can be done. Some of the current users of metric, and then I'll, I'll turn the presentation over to Aisha to talk about uh, uh, eFlux. Is uh, at state level we talked about, but here's just a, kind of a short list of some of the users of the data. You can review this later. Here's uh, some more users, Montana, Texas, Oregon. Uh, some of the commercial applications that have been made by private <clears throat> companies or even by Gallo for manage, managing wine quality. And water consumption and then internationally we're seeing some applications. Uh, access to metric, uh, we generally provide training courses once or twice per year, a four-day training. Here's a recent one conducted in Davis, California. Uh, during that course we provide access to the metric code at a number of different levels of uh, processing. Um, Currently, metric is coded in ERDAS and uh, ArcPy and Python GDAL um, and other teams around the world have uh, used even uh, R and uh, Mat MATLAB and uh, other methods. So the next sec section that uh, Aisha will talk about is the eFlux. Uh, oh, Aisha says that she has to run to class. Okay. So I, I guess I will continue on, uh, but I'd like to introduce Aisha Klitsch. Aisha, you want to 
okay, she had to run to class. I, she apologizes for that. She has a class in uh, remote sensing that she needs to teach. Okay, well, let's continue on. Uh, one of the forms of metric that we have developed over the last uh, three or four years uh, is on the Google Earth Engine. It's called EFLUX, uh, Earth Engine Evaporation Flux. Uh, I'd like to, we'd like to acknowledge our team of developers. It's been a three institution effort with the University of Idaho, University of Nebraska, and Desert Research Institute. We'd also like to recognize uh, the very strong support by uh, Google uh, staff. Uh, currently, Tyler Erickson is a very good day-to-day -day, uh, resource for us. Uh, why ET on Google Earth Engine? Well, the Earth Engine has uh, very strong computing power with uh, parallel processing cloud storage. Uh, it's, it's essentially free access at, at this point in time. Uh, it holds a number of archives. For example, the entire Landsat archive for the globe is on Earth Engine, as are a number of gridded weather data systems that Earth Engine and Google have been kind enough to uh, load into their collection system. So NLDAS, CFS, V2, if you're familiar with those, are available for anyone to use. Uh, as I mentioned, good, strong user support. And then Google just has the right philosophy that they want to make free information available to really improve conditions in the world, both for food supply and for the environment. Uh, here's a little picture of uh, what we get from uh, Earth Engine, uh, the eFlux is very similar to what we saw with Metric. So uh, these types of images, here's a time lapse just for the year of 2008 using Landsat 5 imagery. Uh, the full archive is there, as we indicated, back to 1984, and good imagery never goes bad. It's like a fine wine. It often improves with age. And so we can go back and look at historical water consumption over time. In this case, in the Palo Verde area, we can see the impact of fields that have been fallowed, where that water has been taken into the cities now. And we can monitor any uh, background residual evaporation occurring from precipitation or shallow groundwater. Some of the data resources used by EFLUX on Earth Engine uh, mentioned NLDAS. Uh, a derivative of NLDAS is a very nice daily weather set uh, that's been bias corrected by John Abatzaglu at the University of Idaho. Uh, we use that to estimate our reference ET using the Pema Monteith. There's also the National Land Cover data set uh, available for uh, uh, various years, uh, digital elevation models. We use that for some of the elevation impacts on surface temperature. And then also we uh, have the StatsGo database uh, mounted uh, for the CONUS, continental US, and then we have a, a food and agricultural uh, organization uh, soil database for the rest of the globe. Here's just a, an example of uh, reference ET calculated from the gridded uh, GridMet weather data system uh, that's loaded. Uh, this is again the kind of the potential ET represented by the Pema Monteith. Here you can see high values in 2012 associated with the big drought in the Midwest. So this is used both for calibration and for time integration. One of the intermediate products that we use for calibration of efflux is background evaporation. Just from rainfall events, again, this is coming from the GridMet uh, system that uses PRISM precipitation. And uh, so we, we get the spatial information to tell us for the, the low ET areas of an image what the background evaporation is likely to be. Uh, EFLUX is running for the entire globe. Uh, we'll give a demonstration next. Uh, so we do use some global databases for land use, uh, DEM, and, uh, and of course the Landsat archive is available for both Landsats 5, 7, and 8. Uh, I won't linger here, but just some of the work we've had to do. Uh, one has been to develop a, a web access um, for uh, eFlux and then uh, for cloud detection. Uh, we're working on that right now for the FMASK uh, with Google. Uh, coming is the time integration right now. We're at the snapshot level. So now we will uh, take time out and uh, go to the web and uh, do a, a demonstration. Uh, we're providing URLs for two beta copies of eFlux, uh, what we refer to as a level one and level two. 
the level one is a fully automated uh, calibration. So you, you really don't need any knowledge of ET background, the process or anything, but uh, because it's automated, it may not have as high of accuracy. Uh, we're also giving access to a, what we call a level two, where uh, the user can go in after the initial automated calibration and uh, make some adjustments to the ET image uh, if you would like to try to improve it uh, based on your experience. Level two is really for experienced users who understand the metric process. Um, and if we have time, we'll, we'll go into a demonstration of that. So Brock, I guess we'll uh, switch over to the web now. If, uh, that's Okay, here's that uh, level one uh, URL. So if you you're feel, feel free to follow along, but actually if you can wait, maybe until after my demonstration is done, it'll give me more bandwidth with the, uh, our website. But I'm just putting in that level one URL. The first thing that we will see come up is the eFlux uh, screen. Um, and over on the right is, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but uh, that pin, this is a standard Google Earth type of map. Uh, I can zoom in, zoom out. Uh, the pin is uh, showing the location where I would like to uh, make some processing. So for example, uh, let's just uh, go down into Southern uh, Arizona uh, where there's some irrigated agriculture, a lot of clear images. And then up here on the left, if you can see my cursor is the date range that I am interested in processing. And just as a default, it's coming up with June through September. But if I click on this, I can get some calendars. And for example, if I want to look at a little wider range, let's start with perhaps the 15th of May, and then let's go through the 30th of September, for example. So we're going to explore and see what kinds of images we have available. And uh, so I'm going to come down to this green button at the bottom here and say search for images. So Google Earth Engine is looking through its collection. Uh, it's given us a return here. So it's a drop down box. I'm going to press that green box. And what we see here is a list now of all the available Landsat scenes for that location, uh, a single path row, and uh, that series of time that we looked at. Uh, the top half is for Landsat 7. We can see the LE7 indicated there. And then the bottom half is uh, LC8, meaning Landsat 8. Over on the right is an uh, indication of the amount of clouds available. So just for... Uh, an example, let's just pick the first Landsat 8 image here. It has zero cloudiness. It's for the 1st of June. So I'm going to click on that. And uh, depending on how much traffic we have, uh, I, I get this menu now. It just says, OK, go, do you want to run eFlux? Here's a picture of that image here. We can uh, zoom in on it. Uh, we'll zoom in more later, but we can see a false color. Here's some of the irrigated area south of Phoenix. Here's the Phoenix area over on the left. So I click the Run eFlux button, and uh, we get some options of different uh, products we can look at. You know, here's the original true color image. I push that true color button. Um, looks like it's running a little bit slow. We probably have a, a number of you maybe exploring this. Uh, probably I should have hidden the URL from you so that <laughs> we don't chew up all our bandwidth. But uh, if, if you can uh, maybe wait to uh, run this, it'd be better. So I'm not going to run through very many of these just because it looks like it's running slow because we've got a lot of people trying it out. But here's the true color. But for example, uh, here's a surface temperature map. Let's look at that real quick. Uh, here's one of the beauty, beautiful things of Landsat is that thermal imager. Uh, that uh, and, and we run it through our algorithms and we present a surface temperature map in Kelvin. So we'll run that and then finally I'll, I'll go directly to the ETRF because it looks like it's running slow uh, because we have a lot of users. But here's a surface temperature map. The, the brighter colors are the cooler colors. We can see the, the low temperature associated with some of the irrigated areas. So I'm going to ask, uh, sorry, I should have lingered on that. I'm asking for the ETRF, that fraction of uh, reference evapotranspiration that gives us the relative amount of evapotranspiration. 
that's generally of interest. We, we also like to use ETRF when we review the images uh, to look at how good the calibration uh, looks. You know, do we get the types of high values towards one that we would expect where we have full vegetation? Okay, it looks like it's run and now we have the image coming in from the different cores on the Google Cloud, so they come in at different times. Um, we can zoom in down here uh, in the lower left hand part of the image. Let's see if I can find my cursor. Here we go. So I'm going to just zoom in so we can look at some of the irrigated areas south of Chandler near the town of Mariacopa, fairly well known place. And as we zoom in, uh, we can see that the cloud is recomputing. Um, and now we can, we can start to see the individual fields appearing. The dark green color from the legend going into blue shows high uh, ET. We can see some center pivot fields. We can see some other surface irrigated fields probably. Uh, we can see areas that are not irrigated, either rangeland or just temporarily fallowed fields. We can see the very low ET signal associated with those. Here we can see some of the cores from uh, the Google Cloud still coming in, reporting back. So this is very valuable. Uh, again, this is all automated calibration. So um, sometimes, and, and I want to emphasize, uh, we do, Aisha uh, Kalich's team at uh, the University of Nebraska is doing some of the primary coding on the calibration and interface. And we're still in beta mode. so. This is a beta product. We are updating it weekly. So uh, uh, please come back and uh, look at it from time to time. We hope that it will get better, better and better. Uh, right now with this automated level one product, uh, we allow the download of both the ETRF and then the actual ET. Uh, so once we have our image, if we want to uh, push on that ETRF download button, um, Looks like the site's pretty busy right now, but it, it will give us now a um, means of uh, saving that TIFF file. So let me minimize this so we can see it. So down here at the bottom of my screen, it's asking for uh, to save this TIFF file so I can save it to my computer now. Uh, it's in a zip location. I can just uh, give it a, a very specific name. And uh, the, maybe with the date, and then I can save it to my uh, uh, computer, uh, unzip it, and I'll have a TIFF file that I can bring into any type of viewing system. It's a registered, geo-registered information. It can be brought into GIS uh, and uh, other places. Well, we're getting a little bit past the half hour mark, so uh, feel free to demonstrate that other uh, Level two, I'm not going to try it now because I think the system will run pretty slow. So if we can go back, uh, Brock, maybe to the uh, Adobe application, uh, I'll, I'll just give a few more slides finishing uh, the presentation. What we'd like to talk about is, is kind of, a, I guess, an advertisement. Um, here is is our, the, the very important need for more Landsat type satellites. They don't have to be Landsat, but they need to be Landsat type resolution with thermal imaging. We need that to mitigate clouds. And what I'd like to show you is some work done at the Desert Research Institute by Charles Morton and Justin Huntington, where they've gone through the MODIS archive to look at the uh, cloud identification. And they've run a very nice statistical analysis for the entire continental United States that shows the probability of producing uh, good estimates of water consumption for an entire growing season, for an entire year, where we would like to have at least one cloud-free image every 30 days, once per month, so that we can really track the uh, change in evolution in ET caused by development of vegetation or change in water supply. So here we can see the probability of that happening when we only have one satellite with a 16-day revisit, one Landsat. And we can see that only in the dry parts of California are we up above 70% uh, chance in any particular year of having success, of being able to give the state or the government or local producers field-level uh, maps of evapotranspiration. 
we go into a, a more cloudy place like Nebraska, we're down less than 5% chance, a 1 in 20 chance that any particular year we will feel that we are successful in having monthly evapotranspiration. Southern Idaho, where I'm from, we're up around the 20-30%, and we do see that in practice. Now, if we have two satellites like we currently do, we can see that the situation greatly improves. And for Southern Idaho, for example, we're up to the 70% chance of success. Uh, Southern California, almost every year, we are going to be successful uh, just because it's a low cloud area. But if we go back into the Midwest, like uh, in Lincoln, Nebraska, again, we're still below 20%, 20 to 30% because of the impact of clouds. We just don't get enough snapshots from Landsat so that we get enough clear sky looks. And of course, the eastern United States is all red. Florida is a very cloudy place. And so you have to have a lot of uh, frequent revisit to have any kind of success uh, with a process like uh, metric using strictly Landsat. We have to get into data fusion with Veers and MODIS in that case. Now, if we were to have four satellites with images every four days, it's a binomial type of probability thing. So the probability more than doubles. It goes up like by three or four times. So now for much of the Western United States, we're up in the 80 and 90% probability level. And even in the Eastern United States, we're above 30%. So at least one year out of three, we have some very good accurate estimates of ET at the field scale. Florida still has some, some issues because of clouds. So in a very ideal, very ideal, which we won't see probably in my lifetime, if we were to have eight Landsats uh, or four Landsats that are twice as wide as the current one, so we have a revisit every two days, we can cover almost every location in the United States daily. Excuse me, not daily, but uh, with high success of having ET maps every year with two and then in a utopia where we have uh, one satellite, I guess we're not showing it, uh, it gets even better. But uh, a two day revisit would be just so fantastic for field level water consumption that's so valuable for so many water users and for sustaining water resources usage in the United States. The very last slide, just a little pitch along the same lines, this idea of a two day or even a daily revisit, it's, it's not prohibitively expensive. And we like to call this an earth selfie. We all have our smartphones. We take selfies of ourselves. Why don't we have a field scale satellite system that takes an earth selfie every day? And here's just some very simple math. Uh, if the cost of a Landsat is about $800 million, there's 300 million Americans, we're only asking to launch 16 Landsats would only cost five bucks per American per year. That's just only two coffee lattes per year per American. I, I, we think that that's a very affordable investment to have a field-based selfie every day. So that's our pitch. So we hope that you contact your congressman, uh, uh, communicate with the U.S. Geological Survey who is in charge of the US, uh, Landsat, uh, NASA, but primarily to Congress to help them understand that this is a very affordable uh, uh, idea and uh, it's, it's going to be used by millions of people for water management. So with that, we will stop and uh, just want to thank you. And I, I guess we'll shift into a question and answer. Oh, yes, thank you so much, Rick. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, not only high resolution ET we can see, but so many applications and the great examples, uh, plus EE flux, so easy accessibility of data. So we really thank you for your time and this presentation. Yeah, thank you. It's our pleasure. Pleasure, and, and I actually wanted to apologize that she had to run to her class, uh, so she wasn't able to present. But she's a, a major uh, partner and developer in all of this, as is Justin Huntington at the DRI. So I guess we're, uh, I guess we're getting some uh, questions coming in. Uh, 
Uh, let's, I guess I, I will read these here uh, as Brock uh, indicated, you're, you're free to uh, type in your questions and I, I will go through these as I am able and uh, uh, read the question and then answer it. So hopefully you can all hear me. Uh, looks like the first one question is, have you tried applying metric to daily modus? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, we are able to apply the same algorithms in uh, metric to modus. We just need to use different coefficients for deriving reflectance and surface temperature information, but the uh, technique is uh, essentially identical. Uh, we do process some modus imagery from time to time, but not often uh, simply because of the spatial resolution of modus, which is one kilometer thermal resolution. Uh, so our ET generally is granulated at the one kilometer level. 99% um, of the fields in the United States are smaller than one square kilometer. So we lose that field scale information, which is so essential to us. Uh, there are some techniques, and Martha Anderson of the USDA will be talking next week uh, about some of the fusion techniques where we use a combination of MODIS and Landsat or VIRS, which has 375 meter resolution. That's quite helpful, but we still tend to lose uh, some of the uh, time-based fidelity of the change in ET, especially with irrigated fields where we really don't know when single fields are irrigated right next to a field that may not be irrigated that week, and uh, MODIS tends to kind of fuse all that together. MODIS is a great satellite. We, we, we love MODIS, but it's not nearly as useful as Landsat for field scale water management, uh, which, which is really where it's generally done. Another question we have, uh, were the ET calculations used in groundwater models to calibrate pumping rates from junior and senior water users? Uh, the answer is yes, uh, in a couple different ways. Uh, the state of Idaho Department of Water Resources has taken ET estimates for metric and then compared those with ET uh, estimated or groundwater pumpage, uh, either measured or estimated using electrical power consumption. Uh, sometimes one can establish relationships between uh, electrical uh, kilowatt hours consumed in the amount of water pumped uh, in situations where there are no direct flow meters like propeller meters or sonic meters. Um, and they get uh, a fair correspondence, but uh, it has indicated that the uh, measurements uh, have some uncertainty associated with them. Uh, so that was your second question. Does the flux compare with pumping rates? Uh, uh, it, it, there's a fair correspondence, but it's not a very tight relationship uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, some of it related to the uncertainty in the pumping uh, data. Um, the ET for metric is used directly in groundwater model development uh, by uh, estimating recharge to the aquifer just using a water balance uh, where ET is one of the layers utilized. Uh, and then uh, it's used during operation of the groundwater model where the uh, stress to the aquifer is uh, derived directly from metric uh, ET or uh, derived from weather-based ET estimates that are calibrated with metric or at least uh, compared against metric to uh, confirm. Uh, another question is, can we use metric for small areas like 40 acres or 20 hectares? And the answer is yes. That, that is why we like to use Landsat. Uh, one Landsat pixel, again, is 30 by 30 uh, meters, uh, which is about 1,000 square meters. So it's about one-tenth of one hectare or about one-quarter of an acre. So. Uh, the thermal band, of course, is larger for Landsat 8. It's 100 meters. Um, I, I guess I just, and 100 meters by 100 meters is uh, 10,000. So, <clears throat> excuse me, it's about one hectare in size or about two acres. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a frog in my throat. Uh, 
So we, we can still definitely uh, look at 40 acres, although we do have start to have some edge effects where some of our thermal pixels might uh, straddle the edge of a field. So part of the thermal information is from inside the field, some of it's from outside the field. So we start to get a little bit of uh, bleeding of ET uh, outside of the field edges. And of course, the smaller the field, the larger that edge effect is going to be. Uh, there are some ways of sharpening the thermal uh, using vegetation indices down to 30 meters that we employ and other people employ. Uh, so we, we can we, we feel we can probably get down to about a 10 acre or a five hectare uh, uh, size of field and still give a reasonably accurate estimate of what that field uh, integrated ET for that field might be. Uh, one comment says that they are happy to give up the lattes. So thank you very much. Uh, it might be a little healthier anyway to drink a little bit less coffee. So uh, appreciate appreciate that. Uh, uh, we'll give you information on how to send that money into the U.S. government to help afford the next Landsat system. Let's see. Let me look down. Here's another question. Um, how do you see the performance of simplified models such as the SSEBOP, uh, CBOP, one way to pronounce that, I guess, compared to metric? Uh, CBOP is, stands for the Simplified Surface Energy Balance uh, Operational Model. It's developed by the U.S. Geological Surve uh, Survey at the Eros Data Center in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, in, in uh, some of the blind comparisons, like in the Palo Verde, uh, CBOP uh, was one of the higher ranked methods. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, it was within 10 to 12 percent of the measured values. Uh, one of the benefits of CBOP is that it's uh, generally fully automated and can, uh, takes uh, maybe fewer computer resources to apply. Uh, that's one cons consideration. Uh, I, I think there's plenty of room and opportunity for both models, CBOP and Metric and others, uh, Alexi, Dyslexi, uh, CBAL, Reset. Uh, <clears throat> we, we like to think of Metric as, as being uh, quite useful for those applications that are have quite serious ramifications, for example, for water rights work where uh, so, some of the data has to go into a court of law and undergo a lot of scrutiny. It's probably useful to have a model that uh, human effort review and intervention is used for tuning that model uh, applied by experienced users. And of course, we're attempting to make metric as automated and uh, quick as possible. So it, it's really, I think at that point right now, it's not a big uh, user of time or computer resources. We run it on workstations uh, by individuals. Uh, Justin Huntington uh, runs it on a, a cloud. You just saw the eFlux uh, on the Google Cloud. So there, there's probably less reason to try to overly simplify models uh, these days. Uh, but again, uh, the, the proof is in the pudding. So uh, um, if, if simplified models uh, perform well, then uh, they ought to be used. Another question or can be used and maybe uh, Wim Bas Janssen, I want to recognize him uh, of UNESCO, the global water accounting entity. Uh, Wim is tasked with uh, trying to estimate where water is flowing all over the globe, especially for irrigated food production. And uh, Wim is attempting to create an ensemble of ET from a wide range of ET methods. So rather than use just one method, uh, he's using a number of those. There's a nice presentation by Wim at the World Bank and NASA websites from the ET workshop that was held in Washington, D.C. about a year ago uh, that you, you're welcome to find on the web. Another question, uh, would it be possible to calculate ET with Sentinel-2 imagery? It will cover the same area every five days once both satellites are orbiting. Uh, the answer is yes and no. Uh, let me start with the no part. 
the no part is that one cannot use energy balance with Sentinel because Sentinel-2 does not have a thermal imager, unfortunately. Uh, we were quite dismayed and disappointed uh, that uh, the European community was unable to include a thermal imager. Of course, the planning for Sentinel-2 began 15, 10 years ago. So uh, I think in hindsight, they wish that it did have a thermal imager. Um, there are some future opportunities to put a thermal free flyer in orbit with Sentinel-2. Uh, we hope that that will happen. Uh, but at this point in time, it's not possible to get uh, energy balance based, thermal based ET from Sentinel-2. Uh, one can estimate ET using vegetation indices like NDVI from Sentinel-2. But of course, there's more uncertainty that way because it's unable to capture the impacts of water shortage uh, primarily or evaporation from bare soil. Uh, one generally cannot capture that with shortwave data only. Good question. Another question, can the methodology be used on MODIS and other satellite sensors with similar bands to Landsat? I guess we mentioned that already, and, and the answer again is yes, uh, although the spatial resolution is uh, much larger than what we would like to see for field scale uh, applications. Another question, uh, how can we download the recorded video? I guess Brock and, or Amita could speak to that uh, later. Uh, Eflux cover entire world? Yes, it does. Uh, uh, we do recognize, again, we're in the beta, mode we haven't fully tested the automated calibration for all parts of the world uh, one of the other limitations is that the land cover map is quite large on the order of about uh, five to eight hundred square meters uh, the soils data is, is not quite as good as it is in the united states and the gridded weather data sets may be a little bit less certain so those combined together probably increase the uncertainty of the estimates by EFLUX in uh, some of the other parts of the world. Uh, another question is, what is the advantage of metric over sea ball? I do want to recognize again, uh, Dr. Wim Bastianson, uh, the developer of sea ball, uh, clear back in the late 1990s. Uh, metric originated from Seaball. Uh, Dr. Bastianson was kind enough to share his technology and uh, basic algorithms for Seaball um, that gave the basis for metric and then we have evolved metric uh, uh, kind of separate from Seaball over the last 15 years. So it's quite different now. But the basic philosophy is very similar. Uh, one primary Part of Seaball uh, that we uh, still use is that DT versus temperature function that uh, we covered. Uh, that's directly from Seaball. That's some of the genius, I think, of Seaball and of uh, Bastianson uh, to develop that. That's kind of what makes metric and Seaball what we call engineering models. Uh, it allows the use of inverse calibration. Uh, one of the differences between metric and Seaball is, is in the way of calibration. In metric, we put a lot of emphasis on calibrating to the reference evapotranspiration that we use to represent a near maximum evapotranspiration, whereas Seaball, the classical Seaball, has used temperature of an open water body uh, to establish what we call the cold pixel. Uh, some of the later versions, I understand, do have an advection correction uh, for that water-based temperature to uh, perform better in some of the more arid areas where ET can exceed the uh, amount of net radiation due to advection. Okay, I'll, I'll just keep going on with the questions until people get tired. Uh, we'll, we'll try to answer all of them. I think we're about halfway through or until Amit uh, wants to cut us off. Another question, uh, is it possible to make multi-dimensional modeling of ET using multi-data? Uh, I'm not fully sure what's meant by the multi-dimensional modeling of ET. Uh, there, there have been some good efforts on uh, coupling 
the ET that we get from uh, energy balance, uh, for example, for metric or CBOL or CBOP, um, which, which again is a snapshot of ET over every eight days or every 16 days or whenever we have a clear image, and then use a, a one-dimensional or two-dimensional uh, uh, daily or hourly process model for evapotranspiration in between the dates of the satellite image. Uh, for example, a, a multi-layer Shuttleworth-Wallace type of model. Uh, we've had a, a PhD from the University of Idaho, uh, Ramesh Dungo, uh, develop a, a resistance-based uh, two-source model for that. Uh, actually, it's a three-source model. Uh, so I, I don't know if that's what you mean by multidimensional, but that I think that's in the future where we use the snapshots of ET to uh, inform and calibrate our daily or hourly process models and then use those to simulate the ET process in at least two dimensions uh, in between the images. Uh, Dr. Jan Hendricks of New Mexico Tech uses a similar technique to calibrate some soil water balance hydrologic models. He uses the ET from metric uh, every time he has a satellite image and to parameterize uh, soil water and uh, soil parameters uh, to best reproduce what he sees from the Landsat satellite. And then he's able to use this process model even in years where he does not have satellite data to make very good informed estimates of uh, ET and runoff and groundwater recharge. Another question, uh, can we download the land cover data in EFLUX? Uh, actually, right now we do not make that provision, but if uh, that is something that you would like to have access to, we can probably put those types of uh, download options. Uh, we're trying to keep the interface as simple as possible so that anyone, including a college freshman or a sixth grader in southern New Jersey, can uh, operate EFLUX. So we want to keep it fairly straightforward and simple. Uh, in the level two that we uh, gave the URL for, there is provision to download more of the products. I, I don't recall if land cover is one of those. Can we get the code to calculate ET from EFLUX? Uh, the answer to that is no. We are wanting to protect the EFLUX code for two reasons. One, we want to protect the integrity of the code so that it, it doesn't start to morph into a large number of modifications uh, by various users. Um, and uh, secondly, we are we continue to be in the development stage, so we we it, it'll be a while before we get to that point. With that said, however, there will be an API created. API means application programming interface uh, within the Earth Engine system, so that any Earth Engine user in the future will be able to access the EFLUX algorithms directly in the form of subroutines, for example, one for net radiation, one for albedo, one for surface temperature, one for sensible heat flux. And that way, any other application, for example, a groundwater model or a water balance model that needs an ET layer uh, can ac access the EFLUX uh, API. Uh, as callable subroutines. Uh, you still won't be able to view the code directly, but you will be able to view the functions as they uh, are available. Uh, so that's coming. It probably will be available in another uh, two to four months. Good question. Another question, please explain biases being canceled. Uh, okay, on the right-hand side of the calibration of metric and CBOL. Uh, just very briefly, again, we, we recognize that we have probably systematic biases in surface temperature from Landsat due to our means of atmospheric correction, estimation of emissivity. Uh, we definitely have uncertainty in actual air temperature above each field. We know that that changes with uh, surface temperature, the air temperature does. Uh, we have uh, biases in estimation of aerodynamic resistance. 
So all of those biases are factored into our estimate of sensible heat flux. But because we, during calibration, we, know, we think we know, or we say we know, the evapotranspiration value at two extreme conditions. One is a very well-watered, high vegetation condition. We call that our cold pixel, or the wet pixel. And then we go to a, a bare soil condition uh, that we is mostly dry, and we say that we have a pretty good estimate of what the uh, background ET is from that bare soil. We run a daily soil water process model, so if there's been some recent uh, precipitation events and there's some residual evaporation for the entire image or portions of the image, we will assign a non-zero value for evaporation, even from the hottest pixels in the image. And that gives us the two endpoints where we have confidence in the assigned values of ET. We invert the energy balance to solve for the H, the sensible heat flux that explains those two ET conditions, uh, determine our DT function, our temperature gradient function versus temperature. That ingests all of the biases that went into our calibration. But then when we turn around and we apply this now at all 30 million pixels in that Landsat image, uh, that bias comes back out again because we are using biased net radiation G and H, and they have compensating biases. So our end result, which is ET, uh, hopefully has much less bias. Uh, I see a message from uh, Brock uh, at NASA that says they are working on a way to have the presentations available for download. I guess you guys all saw that too. Uh, another question, uh, how to collaborate with the metric team to validate the model for irrigated crops in India with any covariance and uh, large aperture scintillometry? Uh, with ground measurements. Uh, nice question. Uh, we welcome collaboration. Uh, please contact us. You can uh, Google uh, the internet for uh, metric at the University of Idaho or metric at the University of Nebraska. Get our contact information or uh, perhaps we can type in an email address below for me. Uh, maybe I can do that right now. Feel free to contact us and uh, we're very willing to collaborate. And of course, we, we hope that our collaborators have high quality ground data that is, uh, you know, air checked, uh, has a lot of QA, QC done to it. Uh, it's, it's installed and operated by very experienced, thoughtful people, which I'm sure this person is. Uh, but we look for that also because one can't do much with faulty data. Uh, oftentimes it causes more harm than it may uh, be good. But not, not to cast any doubt on your data. Uh, it's just something that we like to, to request. Uh, another question, uh, is it possible to do a training program on ETS? As we mentioned, we give uh, one or two of these per year. Um, it's about a four-day course. We, we go through some of the physics and background of the energy balance process, get into the highs and uh, whys and hows of the energy balance algorithms and then uh, actually go through the operating the code. It's a mixture of ERDAS code and some ArcPy code to be run in ArcGIS and, and uh, also some of the algorithms are coded in Python GDAL. So you can just contact us directly by email uh, to uh, we can keep you updated on the next planned uh, training course. Another question, uh, what are the differences with SEBS? Uh, SEBS stands for the Surface Energy Balance System, um, developed in the Netherlands, uh, mostly with Bob Sue uh, at the University of Enschede in Wageningen. Uh, SEBS and metric are fairly different. I mean, they are common in that they can both be applied with Landsat thermal data. The primary difference, uh, of course, energy balance is energy balance, so 
I, I'm guessing, I've not looked inside SIBs for a long time, but I'm guessing that the net radiation estimation is similar, use sensible heat flux, ground heat flux estimates. Uh, the main difference is in the calibration where in metric we use two extreme evapotranspiration conditions that we apply either to the entire Landsat image or I should point out in efflux, uh, the level one, we actually use a, a grid for calibration. So we break the image into about 100 sub areas and each of those sub areas has a unique calibration applied to it just so that we can deal with mountain areas better uh, areas close to the ocean where we have colder temperature near the ocean and then the surface temperature warms up as you go inland. Uh, we like to treat that separately. But anyway, metric uh, only has those two extreme conditions that we use. SEPS, on the other hand, develops a calibration specific to every pixel of the image. So uh, image with 30 million pixels has 30 million calibrations. Uh, it uses a theoretical approach to do that, uh, uh, kind of a blending layer up in the atmosphere for wind speed, temperature, and humidity. Um, so it's a very elegant approach. Uh, I like the approach very much, but it does have some operational uh, uncertainties uh, dealing with estimation of that blending layer above the surface um, and uh, estimation of what the maximum, minimum theoretical values of ET are associated with each pixel, and then how the corresponding temperature uh, relates to those uh, endpoints for each pixel. A comment that the efflux site is amazing. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate those comments. Um, we're glad it's working. We didn't know how it would work with a lot of usage all at one time, so I, I guess it's been a good test. Uh, any Issues you have with efflux, feel free to, again, uh, send us uh, emails letting us know the problems you have, uh, the calibrations look high or low. Uh, sometimes uh, efflux will time out. Uh, we only get so much access time to the cloud per run, and if we run out of the milliseconds uh, being allocated, it, it may give you a timeout message. But if you rerun it fairly quickly, uh, Earth Engine does keep what is called a cache of recent products. And some of the intermediate products from eFlux might be cached by Google Earth Engine. So the second time you run, it may run faster and make its way to the end because it's utilizing some of these pre-calculated products. So you might try running it two or three, four times for the same image, same date before you give up uh, to to make it run. Um, otherwise, you may wait to the middle of the night if you're in the U.S. Uh, where there's uh, sometimes less uh, less traffic. And and yes, probably we had a we're at a kind of a high traffic site now, both on Earth Engine and then for our website. So many users, it probably should be better in a couple hours. Another question is uh, drought assessment. Can it be done by ET models in a country like India? And, and definitely, yes. Uh, that's one of the very important usages we think of ET maps is uh, for energy balance based assessment of actual ET. We can see the reduction in actual evaporation that's associated with drought, either direct reduction in rainfall or reduction in available water supply from uh, rivers and canal systems. Uh, it's a very nice way of documenting the actual damage caused by a drought and estimated reductions in food production associated. Uh, it can also be used, for example, in the state of California. Uh, ET maps can be used to assess the acceleration of groundwater depletion brought about by increased pumpage during drought years, uh, increased usage of groundwater by more users uh, in place of uh, water supplies on the surface that are short, and uh, it can be useful for projection of the impact, long-term impact of uh, water usage during droughts. 
Uh, another comment getting towards the end. Uh, I'm surprised by the Florida low availability result because it's actually a fairly sunny location climatologically. And actually, uh, I think this, the slogan for Florida is the sunshine state, isn't it? <laughs> so it's a little bit ironic, but what we find is that at 11 o'clock approximately local time, which is when Landsat comes over, uh, for some reason there just seem to be a lot of small uh, convective types of clouds uh, over Florida that annoyingly uh, mask over the ground surface. Um, it's, it's just what we find. And uh, I guess there is sunshine in between those clouds. And maybe there's more sunshine on the beaches of Florida, maybe closer to the ocean with more clouding inland. Uh, I'm not sure the exact reason, but uh, we, we definitely see a lot of clouds in Florida. So that's why it, it's in those cloudy areas, both in the eastern United States or other parts of the world, uh, in the tropics where we have a lot of clouds. Those are the places where we will greatly benefit from a two-day revisit or four-day revisit of thermal imaging at the field scale. Um, places like Southern California, where it's largely cloud-free, uh, we can get by with two satellites fairly easily. But uh, it's in those other places, and some of them are water short. We really need better information. Uh, we would greatly, greatly benefit, both economically and uh, information-wise, in the ability to manage water much better and produce better food globally if we have a, a shorter revisit time. Okay, I'll keep going. It looks like some people are getting some errors with the uh, eFlux system. Uh, maybe somebody is having a difficulty time unzipping the ETRF file. Uh, may, make sure that it's completely downloaded. It might take a while. It's uh, couple hundred megabytes in size uh, before you try to open it. Otherwise, try a few more times and uh, feel free to email us. Oh, by the way, let me type my email in and I can give you iShase also. So I just uh, gave you the two uh, email addresses. Uh, another question, how do you see the accuracy of data over the region of the Congo Basin with uncertainty of cloud over the area? Uh, I can imagine the Congo Basin of Africa is quite cloudy at times, uh, especially during the wetter seasons. Um, when we have a clear image, uh, we, we can produce accurate information, uh, ET information, but to get the, the time integrated ET, for example, millimeters per month or millimeters of annual ET, which is uh, very important for uh, water management, uh, that's going to become uh, more difficult and more uncertain if we have to wait, say, two months between Landsat and imagery. Uh, there can be a lot happen with vegetation in a two-month period or with water supply that can impact the ET. So we lose accuracy the longer we have to go between Landsat images. So that, that's one area where some of the ways to treat that would be to uh, use some fusion techniques that Martha Anderson will talk about next week with VIRS or MODIS. But again, we start to lose some of the spatial uh, information that way. Uh, but it might be that parts of the Congo Basin, if you, if you don't need field scale information and you're looking more at regional uh, scale ET, uh, there's nothing wrong with using MODIS and VIRS for that, where you do get more looks more often. There's a question that 
there's an impression that the webinar might cover how to estimate ET using Landsat data. Uh, that, that's the metric and efflux process. Uh, we've not gotten into the details of metric, how it works. That probably would take all day to cover all the algorithms, but uh, there are some papers. Uh, we can provide references to them, or I think if you just Google uh, metric and University of Idaho or Nebraska, um, there, there may be some papers that will come up. I'll, I will uh, verify that. That will give all the details of the process. Okay, one more question. Uh, how do you feel about using this TRAD to spatially sharpen LST using NDVI uh, and calculate ET from sharpened LST. Yeah, that is something we do. Uh, we do not use the DISTRAD algorithm. We have our own in-house algorithm where we uh, do use NDVI to distribute thermal, the thermal pixel uh, to the 30 meter scale uh, using a relationship with NDVI. Uh, we depart from the DISRAD technique in that we use that hot and cold pixel from the calibration of metric to give us endpoints uh, on how cold and warm to allow uh, the distributed temperature at 30 meters to get, and it, it helps to constrain the process very well. Okay, it looks like we are at the end of the questions. Uh, we sure appreciate the questions and, and the interest. And um, again, feel free to contact us uh, if you have any uh, additional questions. Yeah, thank you very much for your time today, Rick. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we will close down the session for today. Um, so if uh, we didn't get a chance to get to your questions, uh, Rick provided uh, his email address if, if you wanna uh, follow up on something. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll close it out here today. Um, if you missed any or part of the presentation, we will have it available to stream from the trainings webpage up by tomorrow. Um, so with that, uh, have a great day and we'll see you next week. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Rick. <laughs>